Is there hard evidence that humans evolved from an ape-like ancestor? Does modern DNA evidence support this? Stay tuned on Creation Magazine Live. Welcome to Creation Magazine Live. I'm Richard Fangrad. And I'm Calvin Smith. On today's show, we're going to talk about what evolutionists have been promoting through images and various ideas for many, many years, the notion that humans have evolved from an ape-like ancestor. Right. And some of these uh, ideas or images or just names have become iconic to yes. people, right? So you'll, you'll hear people mention Neanderthals or they'll mention Lucy or uh, this classic Ape to Man series. You know, you see the, even on t-shirts and things like right. that, right, where we become a little more human every, every uh, whatever. Uh, ape-like creature and you know the fact that chimps and people we've got 99% uh, DNA similarity and uh, anyway uh, just these these things that people have, have got stuck in their heads that have convinced them that science has proved that we've evolved from ape-like ancestors. Right and we'll, we'll cover those things on today's show that the fossil evidence that's been found right and also we'll look at this notion of genetic similarity between apes and humans. Right. So let's get kicked off here, and uh, what we're going to do is uh, in this segment is just go through some of this, the, the parade of fossils, so to speak, that have been you know, right. shown to yes. uh, some of the, the ones that have fallen out of favor and some of the ones that are in favor, et cetera. And uh, we can start off here with... Uh, Nebraska Man, one. yes. Yeah. Nebraska Man, there you see a picture of him there in the London Illustrated News. Um, that was this is a full-on full picture with his wife there, and he's walking yeah. around. and What, his tools he's using? What, it, yeah, yeah, he's even got tools, and yeah. it was all based on a tooth. A single tooth was found, and it ended up being the tooth of a pig. Right. And so, <laughs> why do creationists talk about this? Well, we talk about it because we show people how, you know, you've got a pre-belief going into this, right? You believe apes have turned into, ape-like creatures have turned into people, so you're looking for evidence. And oftentimes the evidence that gets shown to, to people, you should question that rather than just swallowing it uh, whole. Because as we've seen in the past, there's been many of these that have just... Yeah, yeah. and that's a particularly bad example where, where such a small amount of evidence was, was, was blown up into the, a full-fledged drawing of, of this creature. Exactly. And of course, one that creationists often mention is Piltdown Man from 1912 to 1953. This was supposedly proof positive that we evolved from ape-like ancestors, and uh, many evolutionists would refer to this. It would be in textbooks, um, and then, of course, in 1953, they re-examined the evidence, found out it was a skull cap of a human with a, the jawbone of an orangutan stuck there. And when they re-examined the evidence, you could actually see the file marks where they had made these uh, these things fit together. And so, not only was it a forgery, but it was a bad forgery. And for 40 right. years, yeah. evolutionists could, could claim, look at this solid evidence. And many Christians caved, right? They said, oh, well, they've got this evidence. Again, you really need to question uh, these, these authority figures when they're saying this because there's been, these examples are, are, are just a few of the examples of, of things that we've seen like this. Right. And how about Neanderthals? I mean, that's a, that's a famous, everyone's heard of Neanderthals. Um, Neanderthal man in 1909, there's uh, the drawing of... Um, what the Neanderthals looked like, and everybody has this this notion of okay, it's this you know huge brow ridges and this hunched over, stooped over appearance, and well, look so at, on. Look at the picture there; and very ape-like, right? Yes, Hair very ape-like. Body, and um. of course, as research has continued, it's it's um, here's an example where where good research has been done, and there's there's been some honesty in the data. If we look at modern museum displays of Neanderthals, they don't look a whole lot different than we do today. <laughs> There's an example there There's of... There's a 2012 Neanderthal. You, you find, find Neanderthals today, and, and evolutionists admit that they were fully human. You know? right. uh, the, the, there's, there's this... Uh, the evidence shows that they probably had diseases that caused their bones not to harden, and that's what caused the deformities. After years right. of use and so on, chewing, it would deform the skull, deform the arms and legs and so on. Well, I mean, there's, there's a huge list of things they found, right? The, the, number one, their brain was actually bigger than ours. I mean, the word Neanderthal, you could actually use that as, as, as almost like calling someone dumb, right? You Neanderthal, right? People would just use it as a byword yeah. for, for being 
dumb or whatever you want yeah, to say. interesting that it's kind of backwards though, isn't it? It is. If they had bigger brains than we do, <laughs> Neanderthal would be a compliment. Hey, you Neanderthal. Exactly. You know, that's, that's a compliment. That's right. <laughs> um, we know that they hunted like things like mammoths, right? And, and so obviously pretty intelligent to coordinate an attack to take down something like that. Uh, they wore clothes. They had stone tools that required uh, a lot of planning to make. Um, they took care of their, their uh, sick. Um, they, they buried their dead with flowers, they made necklaces out of shell beads, used makeup, all these things. So they've actually now, uh, scientists have, have classified Neanderthals as just people, right? not a separate yeah. branch or anything like that. They know they could actually uh, reproduce with humans, so they're just a variant of the, of the humans. Yeah, but the, the popular notion is still that, uh, well, they're, they're uh, uh, something on the way to becoming human, right? and yet that's fallen out of favor. Next we'll talk about Lucy. Many people scoff at the idea that all humans descended from a woman called Eve only thousands of years ago, but geneticists actually endorse a similar idea, known as mitochondrial Eve. By studying the DNA in cell parts known as mitochondria, scientists propose that all humans descended from a single woman that lived 200,000 years ago. But this date relies on evolutionary assumptions, chief of which is the idea chimpanzees and humans shared a common ancestor 6 million years ago. However, actual research has shown that mitochondrial DNA mutates much faster than this evolutionary estimate, and this drastically reduces mitochondrial Eve's age. This would mean that mitochondrial Eve, as a review in the prestigious journal Science said, lived about 6,500 years ago, a figure clearly incompatible with current theories on human origins, but it is compatible with the Bible's history. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. Now, many of you will be familiar with the name Lucy as, mm -hmm. as, a, as a potential ape ancestor for where we came from. Right. Uh, Lucy, the, there, was, there was a number of bones that were found, by no means a complete skeleton. There were uh, footprints in volcanic ash uh, that were dated to over three million years old. And so that, that's some of the, um, the evidence surrounding the Lucy fossils. Right, so they found the footprints. They looked human-like, but they're supposedly three million years old. So that means that obviously whatever made them wasn't human because there were no humans around three million years old. So then they find the bones quite a distance away and they link They'd, the two. They put the two together. And they're listening to the Beatles song, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, when that happens and voila, <laughs> we've got this Lucy. story. Yeah. So you have a very ape-like, uh, very ape-like skeletal structure, but because of the footprints and of course Lucy's feet weren't found, the, the, not the, the foot bones and so on, we don't know where her feet looked like. So you put human feet from these footprints in the volcanic ash, you put human feet on an ape-like ancestor and you have an upright walking ape. Hey, it's and, an ape man. And that's the interesting thing. Look at the pictures here. You've got, you know, Lucy, here's a couple of different depictions from different um, museums. Upright, human-like feet to match the, the volcanic, but as you mentioned, they didn't find her feet. Now, yeah. this is very interesting because they have found more Australopithecines since uh, Lucy. And uh, guess what? They have ape feet. She didn't have, right, uh, yes. human feet. Yep. And so when you go uh, and you, you go to these exhibits, you know, you could, you could ask one of the curators, well, w why did you depict her with human feet if you didn't find her with human feet? Oh, well, you know, the footprints. But that's not direct evidence, right? So then you say, well, why do you still depict her with human feet? Well, you know, it, it teaches evolution so much better. Yeah, it's a yeah. good way to teach evolution. But it's, it's not Might based not on... totally accurate. It's not based on fact. <laughs> and then, you know, I mean, well, yeah, but it takes a lot of money to redesign these uh, exhibits. Well, yeah, but are you supposed to be teaching truth? Or are you just, you know, does it cost a lot of money to get a piece of bristle board and say, by the way, she had eight feet? Like, <laughs> something to clue us in here on, on what's reality. But It's uh, interesting if, if you look at... The, there, there are admissions from... Uh, some folks, museum folks and, and uh, evolutionists, that it's okay to deceive people to get them to believe in evolution. Right. It's okay not to use facts. Yep. And there's uh, an interesting quote that we'll put up here. Um, this is from uh, uh, the, the, this fellow here, Bora uh, Ziv Zivkovic. Zivkovic. Yeah. Ziv thanks. Yeah. A biology teacher uh, uh, and uh, online community man manager at PLOS One, that's the public, public library of science, and, and NOMA, 
non-overlapping non -overlapping yeah, he, magisteria. He, he references Noma, right, in these quotes. He references where, Noma, yeah. Yeah, this, this fallacious concept uh, that Stephen Gould came up with that said, well, there's these non-overlapping magisteria, right? Science and religion, they're two, they don't overlap. Well, of course they overlap, because what sure. you believe about origins, etc. But anyway, he's going to reference that here. Yeah, so. he says this, you cannot bludgeon kids with truth or insult the religion, uh, their parents and their friends, and hope that they will smile and believe you. Yes, Noma is wrong, but it is a good first tool for gaining trust. You have to bring them over to your side, gain their trust, and then hold their hands and help them step by step. And on that slow journey, they will be, which will be painful for many of them, it is okay to use some inaccuracies temporarily if they help you reach the students. Right, so he's this, we had a, uh, an article on this, on, on uh, on our website, creation.com, right. right? So he's saying, yeah, it's okay. You, you can just teach them inaccuracies as long as it gets them to go where we want them to go, right? Uh, yeah. It continues like this. If a student like Natalie Wright, who I, who I quoted from above... You'd have to read the whole article. To yes, yeah. Get, yeah. ...goes on to study biology, then he or she will unlearn the inaccuracies in time. If most of the students do not, but those... If most of the students do not, but those cutesy examples help them accept evolution, then it is okay to keep some of those little inaccuracies for the rest of their lives. <laughs> yeah. And he wow. wrapped up and said, he's using Mickey Mouse as an analogy. You know how they used to draw Mickey Mouse a different way and then they draw him slightly different and slightly different? They use that as an example to show kids evolution. See changes over oh, time. Okay. And he says it's perfectly fine if they keep thinking that Mickey Mouse evolved as long as they think evolution is fine and dandy overall. Without Mickey, they may have been creationist activists instead. Oh no. Without belief in Noma, they would have never accepted anything and well, so be it. Better Noma believers than creationists, don't you think? Wow. Pretty amazing admission from somebody. You can lie to students as long as you convince them of evolution so that they don't become creationist believers instead. I mean, not every evolutionist is going to react this way. Uh, no. But we do have many examples of where fraud has been accepted. Genesis Verse by Verse is a Bible study tool available on CMI's website, designed to help pastors, students, and laymen alike study the book of Genesis like never before. And it's completely free. Simply look up any verse in Genesis 1-11 to or just scroll down the page. The centre column provides links to articles that answer common questions pertaining to that verse and the topics that naturally arise from them. Visit creation.com to use it today. Another very popular argument that humans have evolved from an ape-like ancestor is homology. Homology is a, is a look at similar structures. Right. You can see a, a picture here of similar structures in arms, for example. Whale, frog, horse, human, bat, other things in there all have similar number of bones and similar number of digits. And uh, that's used by evolutionists to say, well, look. Look at this. Look at this. We must have had a common ancestor. That's right. proof that we had a common ancestor. Well, is similarity proof that we have a common ancestor or perhaps something different in common? For example, if you think about the original Porsche and the Volkswagen Beetle, right? right. Uh, they both got air-cooled, flat, horizontally opposed, four-cylinder engines. Uh, they've got uh, in the, uh, engines in the rear. They've got independent rear suspension, two doors, a trunk in the front. Many other similarities are homologies. Why were they so similar? Because they had a common designer. And that argument ends up being a much better argument for living things as well. Exactly. Because whether the similarity is morphology, shape or form, yep. that kind of thing, of a living thing, or it's biochemical, it's at the level of DNA or, or, or something like that, a far better analogy is that there's a common designer. Because if everything was radically different, right. humans were completely different from, and every other animal is completely different, we would get the impression that there was multiple creators. Right. But because there are similarities and things are designed for the purposes for which they were designed in that particular living thing, it points very powerfully to a common designer. Right. I mean, you know, you can virtually take any, uh, anything. You know, you ever got a regular knife and then look, it's, it's changed slightly. Oh, it's, it's a evolving. little wider it's now, you know, to spread your butter better. And oh, look, maybe it popped into a spoon and then, they, hey, maybe the spoon got some pointy ends in here and it became a, a you know a spork and then it finally evolved into the fork I mean wow that's so knives evolved into forks. <laughs> I mean that would be ridiculous and people say well that's silly but this is basically what happens right we get we get shown these diagrams things lined up in a row and then they point to this one turn to that one but no these things were just all designed for the purpose for which they were designed for that's all
There's another common uh, similarity argument, though, right? Many people have heard that you know apes and humans, uh, chimps. You know, we've only got maybe one to two percent difference in DNA. Right. DNA similarity. looking at that level. Yeah, that's right. And of course, we've seen uh, quotes in the past from skeptics. Um, this is Helen Lawrence writing in the Skeptic magazine. She's talking about well, creationist myths. You know, this is what people believed in at a time when we didn't know where we came from. But we do know where we come from. Now we've been bred for proto-human forms, and about eight million years ago, or somewhat less, a common ancestor gave rise to the chimpanzee and us. And she says the chimpanzee is the eight most closely related, with one percent difference uh, between our genus and theirs. And then a long line of skulls show this progression from proto-human, blah blah. So this one one to two percent, um, um, you know. The, difference. The, the difference in DNA. Yeah. It's been taught uh, over and over again. And it also appears in signs of museums. For example, here in the Melbourne Museum in Australia, you yeah. see this again. 99% similarity between apes and humans. And this right. is promoted to support the notion of ape to human evolution. That's right. But, of course, there was an article in Science Magazine just a little while ago called The Myth of 1%. This came out in 2007 in Science Magazine, very evolutionary, uh, you know, staunch, sure, yeah. uh, anti-creationist magazine. And look at what uh, US, uh, UCSD zoologist Pascal Gagno quoted in the article said, For many, many years, the 1% difference served us well because it was underappreciated how similar we were. Now it's totally clear that it's more a hindrance for understanding than a help. So, 1% uh, difference? Uh, no. Yeah, more has been discovered all the time. They even talk, they talked about junk DNA years ago. Yeah. Well, now it's discovered it's not junk. So, we're learning more about the DNA all the time. Right. So, when you hear these authoritative statements, oh, only 1% difference, only 1% to 2% difference, and people just repeat it, right? Because, oh, I learned that in a science textbook, or I learned it in a science class. And then it kind of, you know, browbeats Christians into saying, oh, well, man, man, they've got this, this evidence. And then, you know, you wait long enough. I mean, in our article on, on uh, creation.com, uh, another evolutionary truth now conceded to be myth, you know, they, they discovered that a, the study of gene copy numbers revealed a 6.4% difference. They actually found that the, the chimpanzee genome was 12% larger than the human genome. 13.3% uh, difference in sections of our immune system. Massive differences. Where did they come up with this idea in the first place? Of 1%, yeah. But it Huge serves differences. them well. People repeat it. And it continues to. And it continues, and, and, and Christians accept it too. Maybe we should stick to our guns more about what God's Word says versus what they're saying. For a long time, we've been told that human and chimp DNA is over 98% identical. But even though this figure has now been revised to 95% or less, does that mean that chimps are 95% human? Surprising as it may seem, 99% of mouse genes are present in human DNA, yet no one would consider a mouse 99% human. And humans also share about 50% of our DNA with bananas. But that doesn't mean we're half bananas. Humans are undoubtedly unique. An evolutionary scientist conceded this when he wrote, a physical and mental chasm separates us from all other living creatures. There is no other bipedal mammal, no other mammal controls and uses fire, writes books, travels in space, paints portraits or prays. But the Bible tells us of the most distinguishing human characteristic of all. Humans are made in God's image and that makes us rather special. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website creation.com. Now, more recently, there's been another argument for ape to human evolution. It's called the chromosome 2 fusion model. Right. And this involves uh, the supposed fusion of apes and, uh, apes and human chromosomes that occurred way back when that is proof positive that we evolved from an ape-like ancestor. So it's a little technical, but we'll right. go through it slowly and hopefully uh, you'll get the main points. Yeah, we'll explain exactly what that model is. But first, in order to just understand what their argument is, we need to understand DNA packaging, et cetera. Right. So, um, you know, DNA is like a library of information. So we, we you know, familiar with libraries, let's say a, a, an encyclopedia, a, you know, library of information, DNA is like that. Of course, DNA has chemical letters and these letters make up words uh, codons and those you know, three-letter words and those codons spell out all the information in the DNA for whatever creature you're talking about, similar to how we use letters in our books and such. And so paragraphs of information, you know, what we call paragraphs, that might be a grouping of, of these DNA words, kind of like proteins or, or, you know, something that codes for, for different functions or features in, in whatever creature. We could say those were like paragraphs. But then the books contained in the DNA, that would be what uh, chromosomes are. Okay, so in, uh, 
in living things, uh, you could say the chromosomes are, are like the books of information. So if you okay. had an encyclopedia, let's say a 24-volume encyclopedia set, you'd say, let's say you've got 24 chromosomes or, or, or books. Right. Okay. Now, normally uh, people, humans have 23 chromosome pairs, uh, which is 46 chromosomes, obviously, uh, in total, and apes have 24 chromosome pairs. So uh, we need to have that background information to understand their argument uh, coming up, just so we know how this stuff is, is packaged. Okay? okay, but chromosome rearrangement is not a big deal in itself. Uh, for example, we can look at some butterflies. Butterflies in, uh, in South America, um, there, there's, as you can see here, they, they range from 12 to 88 chromosomes. And the butterflies are fine because they all have the same information. It's just packaged, it's just arranged in a different way. Right, see the chromosome two, fusion model says that two ape chromosomes fused together at one point and created a human chromosome. And so sometimes people will even take that argument superficially and think, oh, well, that's, that's how we got our, our, you know, our number of chromosomes. Right. But the number of chromosomes, it, it really doesn't matter. If you pictured that 24-volume you know, set of encyclopedias, if, if I took the encyclopedia and ripped it in half, so now I have 25 books, so to speak. Right, right. It didn't change the information content. It's just a rearrangement of what's already there. Right, unless you were to split it in the middle of a sentence or something. But if you came to the end of, let's say, a, a, a chapter or something, and you split that up, just like these butterflies here. And, and it's not just butterflies. Right. Uh, we, uh, there, there's a, a man who only has 44 chromosomes. And, and we know about that. It's possible that there may be apes with 46 chromosomes. <laughs> right. it, it's, or, or, or humans with 48. Or, or, that's right, yeah. Right, that, that we don't know about. So really the takeaway point, just so we can begin to understand this argument, is that it's not the number of chromosomes that a creature has that determine what it is. Right. It's the information content, how you split that up, uh, or what, what's contained in there, not, not just so much how you, you split it up. So we'll continue with our explanation in just a moment. For a more in-depth understanding of topics relating to the creation evolution debate, the Journal of Creation contains peer-reviewed research papers that support the biblical account of creation, the flood, and the fall. One subscriber said, I always assumed that this journal would be too academic for me. Not so. I am a Christian with a very inquiring mind. With each issue, I find powerful articles that open doors and shine light on my understanding of the world. Each journal of creation is more than 120 pages and published three times a year. To subscribe, visit creation.com. more information on this topic, uh, I encourage you to look up creation.com slash human chromosome 2 and uh, you can get more information there. Now the evolutionists claim, here, here let, let's set this up so we all understand what we're talking about. There's chromosome 2 fusion model. Here's uh, the evolutionist explanation. The theory is that at some point two ape chromosomes fuse to make a single human one. Why do we think this? Because when we look at human DNA, chromosome 2 looks just like two ape chromosomes stuck together. Right. Okay. So we This is their claim. It looks just like okay. Here's two the evidence, ape chromosomes. Right? Evidence that human chromosome 2 looks just like two uh, chimp chromosomes stuck together and that the evidence that human chromosome 2 has two centromeres. So okay. if we look at the diagram here, we see at the, the end capping, we'll say, of, of chromosomes have these sequences called telomeres repeating sequences of DNA letters, okay? And then where the, uh, the, you know, the, the bits bunch together, that's the centromere, you can see the diagram up here. So, if, if, if these two human, or these two ape chromosomes fuse together, we should see these fusion sites where they, they came together, and there should be evidence that it has two centromeres. Okay, pretty or straightforward at, at least, so far. Yeah, at least had it in the past, okay? So, um, they're coming together here, you've got your fusion site. Okay, these repeating telomeres uh, sites, right, is, is what, what we should see. Um, now, the DNA letters, they're complementary, okay? So you can see it in, in one direction, it would be T-T-A-G-G-G, and in the opposite direction, it would be C-C-C-T-A-A, because the chemical letters of DNA, C bonds with G, and A bonds with T, okay, and, right. et cetera. Yep. Okay, so just, I, I don't want to get bogged down too much here, but we need to understand what the, the argument is, okay? Now, at the fusion site, there should be many of these telomere repeats because, um, but, but the problem is they don't have many, <laughs> but anyway, um, a normal human telomere uh, would have between 1,667 to 2,500 of these TTA 
GGG repeats. At the site, there's less than 35. Wow, so that doesn't seem to fit the story of, of fusion at all, telomere fusion at all. At all. And to the right of the site, there's less than 150 of the complementary CCCTAA sequences. Okay, so again, this doesn't fit with this fusion notion. N not at all, because if, if there were supposed to be, you know, a, let's say, 50,000 of these repeating sequences, <laughs> the, the, the percentage that you have is very, very small. Right. Right? And even uh, evolutionists that have uh, studied this, uh, such as this fellow, said if the fusion site occurred within the telomeric repeat arrays less than six million years ago, why are the arrays at the fusion site so degenerate? So my point is, is that evolutionists will say, yeah, but degeneration occurred, mutations occurred. But what I'm saying is that if you look into the argument, the evolutionists themselves say that within this time frame of six million years, there should not have been that much degeneration. You right. should still see a massive amount of evidence for these telomere sites. Okay, so there's actually, they're actually admitting huge differences. That's right. In the telomeres. Oh, uh, Percentage-wise, it's, it's, it's amazing the amount of difference. Now, another problem is that to date, no functional protein coding genes have been found within the telomere sites of normal humans. However, in this supposed fusion region, in these, these, this chromosome 2, right. uh, there have been 24 potentially functional genes and 16 pseudogenes found within the, the, the 30,000 DNA letter uh, region where these things have supposedly fused together. So there's a lot of functionally useful information. Okay, which telomeres normally don't have. Which they don't have. And within that, again, 6 million year old, uh, time span, even evolutionists are just puzzled. They say, well, how could there possibly be this much useful information just randomly generate within that? Okay, so they're questioning their own notion. I exactly. So if we look at the telomeres, now what about the centromeres? Well, um, there should be evidence that uh, there are two centromeres or used to be two centromeres, right? Sure, yeah. Um, and, and, but what they admit is that they should have left two centromeres, but there is only one now. So the evolutionists are admitting okay. um, that there's, there's only one now. And... Uh, and the reason why they, they said that there were centromeres here and the evidence for it is that every uh, human and great ape chromosome centromere contains a, a, a highly variable DNA sequence that's repeated over and over again. It's called the alphoid sequence. sequence. It's a 171 base pair sequence that are in centromeres. And so they say, well, we, we, we discover these alphoid sequences where we think the centromeres are. But the problem is alphoid sequences aren't uh, limited just to centromeres. If they were to use that argument, you'd have to think that there were, you know, old centromeres all over the, the, the human genome. <laughs> so it, it, it's not a really good argument. And the other thing is, is the, um, the centromere that is there now is in a totally different place than the two centromeres would have been. So they have to wow. think that two degenerated and one popped into place. So you've got different telomeres and different centromeres. So why are they talking about the similarity? It seems like the data is speaking very loudly against those being fused. Exactly.